Hi, I'm Dave Gardy from Maritime TV Studios near Washington, D.C. for the beginning of this four-part series on revitalizing the Merchant Marine with Mike Balzano, author of the book Building a New Majority. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, we had an interview with you last time that got tremendous traffic, and it talked about revitalizing the working class in, in this country through apprenticeship programs and, in, and also in, in revitalizing the Merchant Marine as part of it. So what we would like to do is go through a four-part series that describes the history of, that you personally were right there on the front lines mm -hmm. uh, with some of the presidents of the maritime industry since the uh, back in the Nixon era all the way through in the last third of the 20th century uh, and then see what lessons that has for today if we're going to really revitalize the merchant marine because we talked about being able to win a war against an adversary like China and being able to supply the the ships and the, and the uh, supplies for that. Um, so give us an overview perspective, the last third of the 20th century, the role the presidents played in attempting to expand the maritime industry. Well, uh, the interesting part of this is that if you look back at the history of the world, uh, you go back to 380 and 390 BC, there were two different invasions when the Persians invaded Greece. And in that first invasion, there was a man named Themistocles who noticed that, gee, I, how can we resupply our troops? And he went back after they won the Battle of Marathon and decided that he proposed a, a, a navy that would be a navy that could deliver materials to troops that were already placed. So he became the father of the navy because in the second invasion, the Greeks had a, they had a navy, and he was the commander of it, and they defeated the Greeks for the second time because of naval strength. Um, that's a lesson for us, because you can't, unless you can resupply your troops, you do, they won't survive in any kind of combat. So give us an overview, then, of your experience in the last 30 or 20th century when you really were there on the front lines and there were attempts and have fascinating stories about how the presidents tried to expand and maintain the maritime industry of the United States. Well, you know, let me just say this. My book is a textbook. It's also a history book. But it's autobiographical in that I was there on the scene uh, when a lot of these decisions were being made by U.S. presidents, and most of the people involved are now dead. <laughs> so I've survived them. Um, in the last part of the 20th century, there were three presidents who helped try to revive the maritime industry. The first was President Nixon. Uh, the second was President Reagan. And the third president was the president of the MEBA, the Marine Engineers Beneficial, because he became a critical part of all of the discussions on reviving the maritime industry. Jesse Calhoun. Jesse Calhoun. Jesse Calhoun, correct. Nixon was concerned about building a generation of peace. And one of the things that he spent all of his time on international problems. And he was involved in the strategic arms limitation talks, otherwise known as SALT. And that was the major part of his involvement with the Russians. The idea was to reduce nuclear weapons. The talks had been deadlocked for years. And then all of a sudden, the Russians came over and said, we'll do anything you want. Well, what did that mean? It means that Nixon was able to keep a majority of missiles and throw weight against the Soviets. What happened? The Soviets had a major problem. Uh, they had five years of, uh, of poor crops. They had grain shortages and suddenly became food shortages. There were riots in Poland and some of the other satellite states. The Russians needed grain. Nixon made an agreement with the Russians. We will sell you the grain, and you give us the deal that we talked about, and the Russians agreed to give the Americans the, the advantage. Kissinger was a big player in that because he did a lot of the negotiations behind the scenes. But suddenly, the talks came to a screeching halt because the International Longshoremen's Union would not load the grain. K Kissinger never understood that the ILA called themselves I Love America, and they weren't about to load grain for Soviets. So Kissinger went over and spoke to Jay Lovestone over at the AFL-CIO. Lovestone created a meeting with him with Teddy Gleason. And Gleason said, let him starve. He wouldn't, he wouldn't sell grain. Um, finally, Gleason threw a rock at him and said, tell you what, 
let's 50% of the grain go on American ships. Well, that's not what the Russians wanted because can you imagine the situation of grain coming into Russian ports with an American flag on a ship? No, they weren't going to have that. They were at a deadlock. Nixon went to, to Charles Colson and he said, I, I've got to find a way to break this deadlock. Colson went to Jesse Calhoun. Now, Jesse Calhoun is the labor statesman, respected by everybody. Calhoun said, look, I'm going to need a door prize. Uh, I'm going to need something to offer the unions. Uh, he then asked that the president rehire air traffic controllers that had gone on a sick out the year before. They were all fired, very much like what happened with Reagan years later. So Calhoun argued that if I can do this, I can get the other unions to understand this is an important thing. Reagan and Nixon is reaching out to the unions. Um, so behind the scenes, Calhoun arranged for the ILA to load the grain. Now, they could load the grain, and they gave up the idea of asking for 50% on American bottoms. The media, there were a lot of stories in the labor press about that. The unions, as far as they were concerned, had clearly surrendered. They had clearly lost which was interesting because, unbeknown to everyone, there was conversation going on behind the scenes. <clears throat> the media portrayed it. In fact, even a book that was written two years ago that's called The uh, Collision Course. Mm -hmm. The young guy there says that, well, you see, the unions, all, all Jesse Calhoun wanted was to get the number of air traffic controllers to be on the MEBA side of the equation so that they report to MEBA, but they're on their own, okay? Um, but they could, they, that's the way they affiliated with the AFL-CIO. So the whole story became, well, an affiliation story with Jesse Calhoun and the uh, air traffic controllers. That's not what, what was happening. Behind the scenes, Colson, Nixon, and Calhoun were talking about how do we save the maritime industry. This all is occurring around the same time that there's a great debate over the Alaskan oil. Um, American companies wanted to drill. The environmentalists wouldn't let them drill. Then there came the question of the native claims. How are you going to get, the, who's going to take care of these natives? And suddenly we had the first Arab oil embargo. And Nixon grabbed it, pulled everybody together and said, okay, Alaskan oil, okay, you get to drill. The native claims, we're going to pay each and every person who's got Alaskan blood, native bull, they're all going to get a, a paycheck, okay? And then he moved and said, and we're going to open up the oil fields, and we're going to have American ships deliver that oil. Now, suddenly, American ships, we don't have a fleet. That's when the whole thing came clear that there was a backroom negotiation going on and Jesse Calhoun made the deal that we, the United States, would be the carrier of the Alaskan oil. And can you give us some details of that deal? Yeah, yeah. Because the details are very important because they leaked over into the next several administrations. Calhoun would build a fleet of ships. They weren't subsidized. We were going to build the ships. The, the private sector would build the ships. The oil would be Jones Act trade. Now, that meant you had to have an American-built ship. It had to be from one American port to another. But unlike the Jones Act trade, a condition was made that the oil could not be sold internationally. It was only for the lower 48 states. Whoa. Now you have a situation where the United States flag fleet has a guarantee that we are going to be able to move that oil. But both Nixon and Calhoun were concerned. What happens when the next administration comes in? You see, Nixon made a move to go through the Congress and place a 10-year ban on selling any of that oil to any place but the lower 48 states. Now, 
the Alaskans wanted to sell oil <laughs> to anybody. Um, the Japanese wanted that oil. And geographically, they were closer to it. The 10-year ban prevented the Japanese or the Alaskans or any other nation from getting involved in buying, selling, or moving that oil. It was 100% American flag. So that ban began in 1973, effectively making the 10 years 1983 when the ban would uh, expire, mm -hmm. which is uh, what we will discuss next time in the next series. But the, why didn't the media report on this? I'm just curious. Well, first of all, in the Nixon White House, things were kept pretty much under, under, under wraps. Colson and Calhoun, they made the deal, and Calhoun assured the, the other unions in the maritime industry something good is going to happen. His word was strong enough for everyone to back off. They backed off the 50% demand. They backed off loading the grain. This was a major concession on the part of the, IA, on the ILA. And the interesting part of it is no one knew that there was something afoot. Interesting. So next time, we'll talk about what happened in 1983. Mike Bolzano, again in this series on revitalizing the merchant marine lessons learned from the last third of the century in the United States. I'm Dave Gardy here for this special presentation on Maritime TV from our studios near Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us.